What's going on, beautiful people, beautiful people? It is a new week. Hope all of you are out there just thriving, thriving in 2023. Uh, but, you know, uh, it is 2023, a new year, but I wanted to bring back a familiar face. Uh, Kevin, he's been here before. Uh, he's a man of many talents, a jack of all trades, uh, as, I like, as I like to say. The last time I think I actually, you know, caught up with them was uh, at the Black Cannabis Week. So uh, nice to see you again. Nice to be here. Nice to see you uh, as well. And yeah, you're correct. It was Black Cannabis Week in uh, beautiful Philly, the city of brotherly love. We had a good time, I must say. Um, yes. And we got to connect with a lot of uh, Black cannabis professionals from all over the uh, eastern seaboard. So that was something. And we partied a little bit, too. Uh, were you there for the for the after parties? Because they were tremendous. I want to say I want to say I went to at least one. Yeah, because we stayed over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We definitely, we definitely went to at least one. Yeah, I went to one. I think the night you were being honored, actually, and you missed, oh, okay. and you missed. Oh, that. Oh, that, that was the no, night no, before the event. It was nomination. It was nominated, not honored necessarily. I feel you, but to be nominated is that not an I honor? To be nominated. <laughs> yes, you're right. I just didn't win. That's why I was like, oh, yeah, oh, okay. yeah, yeah. So he's like, yeah. all right, I don't need to be there. No, 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 no. I, for me, I think I had the kids that week, so. It was ah, even, okay. you know, a lot of coordination to to be able to make it up there for those, uh, you know, th that time that I did. Um, so yeah, but but I was there in spirit, and and next year yeah. I'm planning accordingly. I'm gonna make sure to make that Friday event because um, the Friday event looked really really good. It seemed like it, like there was a lot of quality people out there, and yeah, man. You know, one of the big things I've seen in the cannabis space is just like, you know, there's three degrees of separation. Have you have you uh, realized that? Yeah, like everyone that I know knows you pretty much or knows yeah. of you. Um, and you can pretty you can get connected to anyone that you really want to collaborate with yes. within your network already, whether you think so or not, especially. I mean, I'll take it as far as like sometimes even going out west from my connections on the East Coast, uh, the the seven degrees or three degrees of separation, whatever you want to call it, it extends way beyond just uh, the DMV area or just the East Coast when it comes to cannabis. Uh, and I think that it's very important for us to leverage that community uh, because, you know, you're a politician, you know how important uh, the size of the voice is in the battle, right? Like if you're trying to make some change, one person can do a lot for sure, but one person that's backed by a nation of a community can do a lot more. Um, and I'm sure you've seen that. No, I, I agree that that speaks power. You know, of course, sometimes you just need one match to spark the, you know, spark the flame. Right. But um, you, you need that collective uh, power. Uh, you need that, that collective fire to keep burning. Absolutely. That's the way I think about it. Um, and, and so I, I just took a, you know, a trip recently, um, you know, a weekend trip, Sometimes those weekend trips are needed, right? Like a lot of times we think Absolutely. about, a lot of times we think about like being able to get away, and we have to find like, you know, good amount of days. No, sometimes just take that weekend, you know. So just, just, just go, to, yep. go to a different area. Uh, but but I was able to go to uh, Massachusetts and uh, Maine, uh -huh. and you know one of the things while I was there was you know everywhere I am I want to see what the cannabis laws are for one, just being a cannabis enthusiast and a policy guy. You know, I want to see what the laws are. But two, you know, I want to see what cannabis experiences they have. Right. Because I think that there's a little bit that can be learned, you know, from everywhere that, you know, they, they are doing uh, some good things around cannabis. Yeah. Right? And, absolutely. So, and so Massachusetts, they got med. Um, they got they got rec. Um, and then I think Maine has ma uh, med and rec, too. I will stand by this statement, Kev. Massachusetts has the best, cleanest organic cannabis you know, here on the East Coast, really, the U.S. You know, they, they've had a medical program for a long time, and that probably contributes to that. Because one of the issues that I always find with new jurisdictions that open medical programs is that they are required to cultivate their own cannabis naturally. So yes. it means that, you know, people are essentially starting from scratch. You have an entire market starting from scratch, whereby the standard of California has been long set, right? 
And I think that's one of the difficulties navigating these new markets is that, uh, you know, people have a certain standard of quality uh, that they associate right. with the black market. And then when the white market occurs, and also I think we should stop calling it black market and white market, by the way, but we'll get to that later. Uh, yeah. But when, when the new markets uh, uh, emerge, people have to essentially, unless you're shipping growers in from California, which they did in uh, Michigan uh, quite a bit a few years ago, but like for DC, everyone's learning from scratch. Like I have some friends yeah. that are putting together a cultivation um, center right now in DC and you know they're in contact with the government they're doing everything by you know on the right side of the law and but they're starting from scratch like they're learning how to grow to eventually have an industrial size grow in the next year to 18 months so wow. it's it's crazy it's crazy I, I mean they're very committed is it, wait have, is that the program is is that the program that was uh that was next to capsule dam is that the uh no so uh it's not next to capture them but it's it's um it's i don't want to exact so it's affiliated with a company right that operates in the gray market so i don't exactly want to uh i know i understand much. hey i get but, you i get you but they're they're I need the information after i need that you know that, that's what i'm yeah. saying <laughs> they're transferring over to the mainstream market once that happens and the interesting thing is like now in dc because i'm i live in dc uh the people I believe who are going to win are the ones who are preparing as if the laws and everything is already in place, as if all regulations are in place. You have to prepare ahead of time. You have to dot all your yeah. I's and cross all your T's way before the bills are signed. Because right now we have a bill that was passed by our council to allow for this, to allow for more cultivation centers, to allow for recreational sales. But D.C. has a very specific circumstance because, you know, no taxation without representation has to go through Congress and all that. So we can still face issues with the Harris Rider, which has been blocking our progress uh, on cannabis for many years. But the people that I believe and the companies that are going to win are the ones who are putting together, you know, the groundwork for testing facilities, for cultivation centers, from now, before things are completely perfect in, in place, the ones who are working right now are the ones who are going to win. Yeah, agreed, agreed. And and so one of the things that, um, of course, you know, I, I'll come back to Maine and, and, and highlight them, talk about my favorite brands. But one of the things I was talking to somebody about what to look forward to, you know, in, in the Maryland market, because, of course, in the Maryland market, we'll have a few things popping up, right? In, in July, legalization happens. We voted overwhelmingly, um, you know, this November that we should legalize as a state. I think it was like 73% of Marylanders, wow. I believe. Yeah, so it was it was a very, very good percentage. Um, but the biggest thing that somebody said, and it kind of made me think was, they said, you know, social equity, we want the social equity. I said, without a doubt, we won't want social equity. Social equity is a buzzword. So yeah. what I basically what I basically said to them was, you know, what exactly do you want? They want unlimited licenses. I said, OK, you know, I entertain that. I said further. I said further than that. Um, you know, how, how are you going to, uh, you know, basically make sure that people who are legacy and, you know, people that are social equity are able to actually, you know, get past, you know, starting point or, you know, applicant applicant or conditional phase, you know, and they provided some examples. And then one of the things is I ask them is like, how do they feel about micro licenses? And then outside of micro licenses, you know, how do they feel about the cottage businesses? Right. And, you know, I explained to them what the cottage businesses were. And explain to me, too. What is the cottage business? Sure. Sure. And so basically a cottage business, um, like think of it. I have a friend who has a CBD hemp company um, and, you know, at this point you can legally sell CBD hemp. Right. Um, she goes to the, the farmer's market, you know, sells her products. She sells her products at other fairs and, you know, festivals. And so if we, you know, had cottage business licenses, we can allow, you know, uh, people just like her, you know, have CBD and hemp, but uh, also okay. THC uh, products to be tested and sold, you know, in the, in the recreational medical market. Right. And, and kind of so, like a pop up, a pop up license of sorts. Yeah, it, it would be like, yes, it would be necessarily a pop up license of sorts. But like, I would think of it like a like a micro 
they like most of them would be micro cultivators to to an extent right and then they're just um making products out of the the the, the, the plants that they are are cultivating um and so it's essentially like kind of tied to home growth for the most part because most of the people that i know that would be cottage businesses um you know like let's just say they've run a, a cbd um you know and, and a credible uh credible uh pastry company you know but then they want to start learning how to do the infusions and stuff like that so with yeah. that being said they could be like that cottage business right and so okay and then so, they could offer like some sort of like kind of like a temporary you know how like um if you want to do an event, you can get a temporary liquor license. Um, it's like an extension of that, maybe a temporary license or a smaller yeah. license that doesn't have the same barrier for entry. If you want to have like a smaller business. Exactly. So, so think of it as like, imagine people starting with the food truck for years before they got a restaurant. Yes. Right. And, and, that and, that, and that food truck helped them, you know, get to that stage where they can, you know, afford the overhead of a restaurant and, and more employees mm -hmm. and, to actually branch out. And so it, it's a way for those the, the, those smaller businesses to kind of scale up organically. Um, it, it, if so, they're, they're, they're doing well. And, you know, like one of those people I could think of is, have you ever heard of uh, Lucy CBD or Lucy's Lozenges or Lucy Lucy's Escudero? Lozenges, I've heard of, yes. I've heard exactly. of that brand. So I would think of like her as like one of the like more like macro college businesses, right? Like I'm sure she started out of her garage or something like now she's, you know, award winning and, you know, like, like, like giving speeches all over the U.S. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, and it started right out the garage, right? Exactly. Or something exactly. like that or something like that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But so what that what that person proposed was they said, imagine if, you know, these cottage businesses were able to get selling first. Like, imagine if they, they were the first ones to be able to sell in the market. Like, I would think that that would be, you know, real equity. And I was like, hmm. That's a yes. You know what? And I'm gonna you know, I said I'm gonna come back to that. That's not a terrible idea. Um, quick question for you. Uh as far as social equity, do you know if New York, because I know New York just opened the first two legal recreational dispensaries they just opened in the past few months, and they cool. had a mandate to have some percentage of the dispensaries go to social equity candidates, specifically people affected um, by the war on drugs, you know, uh, returning, returning citizens. Um, do you know anything about the New York system by any chance? Cause, uh, I know that they just started and I was wondering, this is kind of like an off topic thing, but I was just wondering if, if any of those two dispensaries that just opened are legitimate social equity dispensaries. Cause they were supposed to be, the first ones were supposed to be. That I, that's probably a good question. So I have to check in with my New Jersey folks. Um, mm. I would say that I think at least one of them were like mm -hmm. minority owned. Yeah. Um, I, I do believe I remember that. And I think it was the very first one. I believe that one was minority owned, like by him and his wife, I believe. Um, okay. I don't, I don't remember the second one, but I will check in with my New York folks. So that's a great question. I know that New Jersey had been doing a lot better with like, um, incorporating people who were quote unquote legacy market, um, you know, who had fueled the economy, you know, long before we had talks of legalization. Yes. You know, so. Which is a nice way to say it. Uh, I, you know, you know, it's funny. I have to give credit, a little bit of credit to the DC council because as difficult as they, well, let's not say difficult, as difficult as the issue has been over the past few years, um, with these like emergency votes and like threatening to shut down uh, the gift shops in D.C., they actually collaborated with the I-71 committee, which is a committee made up primarily of black and brown citizens in the cannabis industry, specifically in the gift shop industry in D.C., to write the law together, um, which is like one of these very rare moments of like civic cooperation that you really just got to applaud because for the longest it felt like the dc council was trying to gut uh you know kind of the heart of the dc cannabis industry but which was the gray market credit which, which was, was the, the gray market yeah just to be clear. i mean because be I, I mean i love all of the medical dispensaries in dc as well but they can they could never handle the size of the market 
uh, the just demand was too high, mostly coming from people from your side of town, Maryland and Virginia folks, which obviously that's going to change soon. But well, uh, well, Kevin, what I wanted to ask you, people might not know, given the Reader's Digest, what is this white, gray and black market in D.C.? Oh, right. and, so know, other places coming up. OK, so a lot of other places have this, too. But D.C. was one of the first places to have a, a very large gray market. And first off, we'll say what the black market is. The black market is, you know, you call your boy or your dealer. And he comes through or you meet him in an alley and it's shady and you, yeah. who knows what could happen. That's the black market. Um, the white market, which we have to find a new term for that, but the white market would be what's completely legal. So in D.C., it'd be the medical dispensaries. Right. And the gray market is mm. kind of in between. So the gray market in D.C., is the gift shop economy. And what we have in DC is a law that was passed in 2014, uh, I-71, that allowed for individuals to grow at home, have up to two ounces on their person, gift up to one ounce to another person. Um, but there was no law for recreational sales. So some uh, creative individuals decided that they would do something like sell you a marker mm -hmm. for $60 and then gift you some portion of cannabis. And it came in Ooh. all types of different forms. Like the first iterations of it were, you know, people selling candles, people selling shirts or offering services, uh, even people selling speeches, which I think is pretty ingenious because it requires oh, no inventory. I don't remember that one. I don't remember that yeah. One, that one. yeah. Um, and so that market has grown tremendously to the point now where I'm not sure what the numbers are exactly, but we have in excess of 50, maybe close to 100 shops, uh, possibly even more. I couldn't, I couldn't even tell you, uh, but they're everywhere. And the police have decided to kind of take a hands off approach. So we were going through it with the council for a while where the council was like, oh, we need to enforce the law and shut down gift shops. But the public reacted and said, no, we don't want you to shut down gift shops. People called their councilmen and councilwomen and, you know, signed petition to prevent this from happening. But they threatened it like over the past three years, I would say like three or four times yeah. um, to the point where they were about to sign uh, emergency bills. And on the day of vote, they would either, you know, lose by one vote or cancel the vote. Like it was always it was like a movie um, for yeah. people in the industry who are waiting to hear what was happening. Uh, so the gray market. I mean, Chair Mendelssohn. Was, yeah, yeah. But, I mean, you know, yeah. it seemed like he was trying to destroy that market. A lot of people said, oh, he's in the pocket of the medical dispensaries. That was one of the criticisms of, of him. Um, but. I got to give them credit because on this bill, they came together, they figured out a pathway for gray market businesses to go into the mainstream and to be legitimate, regulated yeah. businesses. Um, they have a social equity component. Uh, so, you know, this bill is probably, it's not perfect, but it's like one yeah. of the most comprehensive full bills that addresses the issues of the people on the ground the actual people who are in these shops making dc cannabis move well let me let me ask you this you know dc cannabis you know i i had been in in that gifting community long before being a medical patient so yeah. big up dc i appreciate y'all i do think you guys have um you know a good a good ethos around home growth and you know people learning people learning to grow their own cannabis you know i'm still a big proponent of that you know you know, you should all, you should all learn how to grow, right? You should all learn how to grow your own food um, to sustain yourself. Um, you know, that's important. The big question I have for you is what do you foresee or what have you seen to be some of the biggest obstacles for minorities in the cannabis industry? I would say funding. Funding would probably be the biggest hurdle just because for the most part, um, you know, financial literacy is moving and it's it's growing. But in our community, a lot of us are not familiar 
with uh, how to get from point A to point Z when it comes to like funding requests for a business, especially for a cannabis business. Um, but I, other than that, other than that, I would say DC over the past few years has proved like fairly friendly to the black cannabis entrepreneur, um, at least on paper. Like they want black entrepreneurs in cannabis, uh, but initially they wanted black entrepreneurs in cannabis in the medical uh, arena, right? Uh, medical, and yeah, the, okay. gift, the gift shop economy is predominantly ran by black people in DC, predominantly. Sure. Sure. So when when they talked about shutting down these shops, not intentionally, but it quickly became a racial issue because the reality was you'd be putting out, a, you put, you'd be putting black and brown people out of work uh, and shutting mm -hmm. down businesses that are a lot of these businesses. You know, they're, they're paying taxes to the city. Like there are a few bad players, but the majority of these businesses are registered. Are registered with the Office of Tax and Revenue, are registered with the DCRA, and are contributing to the DC community. And those are the businesses that are going to graduate into the regulated industry. Uh, there, I, I know some uh, shop owners that have been keeping up with, you know, they've been keeping up with additional taxes that are not even owed in the event that if they're approved, they would offer additional tax dollars to the city. Like wow. vo volunteering it. Because if if this were like California, if it was if things were taxed at the rate of California, then DC would collect a lot more. So I, I know some people who are using the California format to put money aside. And so the California is what, like 30 plus percent? Something crazy like that, yeah. And, and what are you guys around 15? Well, we just we don't have a cannabis tax because there's no recreational sales system or no law yet. So it's just right. regular sales tax. Uh, like and, there's no and, special cannabis tax. So I'm saying that some businesses are voluntarily putting aside those funds to present a better case when it's time to file an application. Absolutely. I, I, I understand with, with that, you know, hey, like what what yeah. government officials not going to want like uh, some business coming in and saying, oh, I, you know, I have another four hundred thousand dollars to offer the city because we've been uh, collecting these tax dollars while we're in the in the gray market. Of course. I mean, I, I agree. And and so, you know, we, we talked, uh, you know, we talked about, um, you know, some obstacles. How can ca cannabis be used to you know, heal the community. That was a question that I remember was asked at the Black Cannabis Conference. And I think we spoke on it a little bit. Um, you know, has cannabis healed yeah. you? You know, and oh, how do you man. heal the community? Right? I'd say cannabis heals, you know, heals me every day. <laughs> I mean, cannabis, cannabis heals me every day. I, I would say that right now I'm in a time of not uh, smoking a lot, but I've been eating a lot of uh, CBD, THC blend gummies, especially for um, before bed and just for relaxation in general. Uh, yeah. But as far as healing the community, I will say cannabis as an option. Let's just look at it as an intoxicant, right? Let's let's yeah. remove the medical component as an option, as an intoxicant can save lives if it's used as a substitute for alcohol. Uh, like I have a lot of friends that I know of Oh, did I lose you? Looks like I lost Mark. No. Oh, there you go. Uh, no, I, I, I was giving you the spotlight. I was giving you the spotlight. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. Let me get the spotlight. Uh, cannabis as a substitute for alcohol can literally save lives. If you are looking for an intoxicant, if you're looking for a way to change your state of mind and you want to party, uh, no one has ever, that I know of, gotten into major altercations due to cannabis. There's not the same amount of car accidents or just disagreements. Uh, cannabis just offers serenity and calm. And obviously it has its issues. It's not something that should be overindulged in. Uh, everyone needs to be a responsible adult. But I do believe that as far as having it as a viable intoxicant, 
um, as a choice that you can make between cannabis and alcohol, you are literally saving yourself and saving future generations by choosing cannabis over alcohol. Alcohol is a deadly poisonous substance that when it goes into your system, I've learned about this recently because I'm very uh, much into fitness. But when you drink alcohol, it your body needs to get the alcohol out of your system before it can break anything else down. So let's say you go out to dinner and you have some glasses of wine with your steak, right? Your body cannot process the steak until the alcohol is out of your system. That's why when you have a big meal with alcohol, you might feel a little groggy or you might feel weird the next day or maybe even for a couple of days. The body is rejecting it because it's poison. The body does not reject cannabis like that. The body mm. has CBD in the body has cannabinoids naturally yes. before you even touch cannabis. It has cannabinoids naturally. You know what it doesn't have? Alcohol. You know, alcohol in your body, just chilling. You never heard that's, somebody had Jameson in their system. That's okay, a great you point. Put that is poison. So wow. I'm getting fired up. I'm getting fired up. No, I'm glad you highlight that. I'm glad you highlighted that. You know, that was profound. One of the things I wanted to say is, Kev, you're a serial entrepreneur. So I, I you know, I, 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 um, last time I saw you, I had your own brand of, uh, what was it, own brand of cannabis and vapes? Oh, and... The, the cartridges. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. I, I produce, I manufacture my own vapes, uh, mostly because it started a few years ago because there was that whole issue with people putting vitamin E and various oils in, um, vapes that were, people were getting sick. Some people were dying. Um, and then I noticed that vape cartridges were the largest expanding uh, category of product in dispensaries. So I was like, okay. And I got it. Cause like, you know, it's, they're very convenient. You can smoke them anywhere. Uh, but I realized that if I was going to participate in that market, I wanted to know with a hundred percent certainty, everything that was in the product. So that's when I decided to start uh, making them. I have to actually uh, give credit to uh, a friend of mine, Phone Homie, uh, AKA Rico Valderrama, who recently passed away, um, you know, rest in peace, Rico. But he was the one who convinced me to move forward with my own branded products. You know what I mean? If it weren't for him, I would have been, I would have been scared because he was doing it way, you know, years and years ago. And I was he telling was him not to. He's one of the first I met in the game. Yeah. You know, yeah. Uh, very, very yeah, great. Absolutely. Dude. Very great dude. And he could, he could take one hell of a dad, man. One yeah, hell yeah. of a dad. Um, and, and so, you know, just to segue a little bit, we talked about the different brands. I also saw one of your episodes that I found to be very intriguing. Um, it was called the toxic tavern and, and it, it had, oh, it hold, had on, hold, on. <laughs> <laughs> hold on now. Okay. Cause that's a, so I do a bunch of different podcasts, you know, I was doing yes. a podcast with that, with the outlaw report, uh, the yes. session and that's a cannabis based podcast. That's how we met. Okay, okay. So wait, um, this, was the sesh. this wasn't the sesh, right? This no, is... no, 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 no. This was my own podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. I was okay. kind of inspired by a lot of the content that I saw on YouTube where, um, you know, men and women were talking about kind of dating issues and relationship issues. But I found it that like a that lot dope. of the guys. I loved it. I, that was dope. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had a lot of fun and, and those ladies are, are good friends of mine. Um, and I'm actually going to be doing more of those. I need to get back with the outlaw report to resume doing the sesh, but I'm actually, okay. I just got a new studio. Yeah, um, yeah, you already know. I'm right there. Yeah. Yeah. I just got, I just, uh, built out a new studio, uh, to be, to shoot what's called the KLM podcast. That's my podcast where I'll be talking about, mostly I'll be talking about wellness issues moving forward. Like there'll be a couple of toxic taverns too, but yeah, I, yeah. I'm going to focus. My niche is going to be wellness health um you know cbd specifically but there will be yes. some cannabis talk there uh yoga yeah. meditation um gratitude things of that nature that's kind of uh because i realize a lot of people have been asking me for advice on those things uh offering to pay me to give them advice on those things asking me if yeah. i have a coaching program and i was like you know what maybe this is the niche that i should be producing content in so uh, sure. I will, but I, but I'm going to do the toxic tavern again, at least well, once. I mean, it was, it was very like, you know, it was very relaxing and, you know, it was yeah. something I kind of just stumbled upon. Like it was a different, it was a different side of, of KLM, right? Like, you know, 
<laughs> you know, give a side of Kalen. But 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 the guests were great too, right? Like we got to give the yeah, guests. Yeah. That's what the great guests too. were great, yeah. and we did it at Capsterdam, so we were able to uh, enjoy Flower while we uh, yes. had our had our um, episode. So that was great. Uh, Capsterdam uh, ha still has some of the greatest uh, flower available. Uh, they teach people how to grow there, and also in the back of Capsterdam, there's a location. It's called the bookstore where you can check out various flowers, some grown locally, some from all over. Uh, and all sorts of products. So yeah, you should definitely, definitely check that out. Capsterdam in Adams Morgan. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta start taking my grow classes, man. So learn how to cultivate. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so what are, what are the things I, I, I wanted to make sure we do again is just getting some, some rapid questions in. Uh, of course, okay. kind of on the top of the dome. How you feeling? I don't, I don't think we asked you these questions. So it's a different set of questions. DC statehood. You a fan? As a concept, I don't think it'll ever happen okay. politically because for the same reason, you know, Puerto Rican statehood, it's not going to happen because it offsets the balance. I mean, you know, these it offsets yeah. the balance of, uh, of votes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I mean, hey, you guys, you guys deserve a vote, man. And um, agree. Agree. You, you and it would. DC statehood would solve all the issues. Like the reason why we haven't figured out cannabis regulation is because of the lack of DC statehood. And, you know, you yes. have people from Congress from all over the country who are deciding what happens with DC's budget, who've never even set foot inside of the district limits. So it's absurd, but it's been like this, what, since Marion Barry's second term? Right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's my next question is favorite anime. Listen, bro, I I'm just gonna say Naruto because it's the only one I know. I, I oh, have, okay. I'm, not, I, the right I'm one older. The right one listen, at least. Listen, I don't know what era it happened where all of a sudden black men were obsessed with anime, but I missed that. I, they didn't <laughs> send me that text. You feel me? I was on Power yeah. Rangers, is what I was on. I was on the Power Good Rangers. Life. Say less. So when they, you know, they Tommy just died. Tommy just died a few months Tommy ago. Tommy did just die. Tommy did Green just. Rest in peace, R2. Tommy. Rest in peace, phone homie. Yes. <laughs> um, well, but, uh, well, I want to say black anime is becoming even more popular. And and for me, I didn't notice I liked anime until I got older, right? Like I watched the Pokemon, I watched the Dragon Ball Z, I watched the Sailor Moon, the Yu Yu Hakusho. Show. Um, a lot of those were on like American networks. You know, I think it was like a uh, Toonami and. You know, Adult Swim. So, yeah. I never, I've never actually seen anime, like a full yeah. episode of any show or any film. But all my nephews, my nephews who are in their twenties, yeah, they, all the, they just they, they listen to drill music and watch anime. Hey, it's, it's a weird so combination. It's it's a that weird a combination. Yes, yes. If you see like a lot of younger music videos, younger you know music artists, yeah. They, they have a uh, concept. And Uzi, Uzi has a lot of yes. anime concepts. Uh, Jane and Smith. Rob Banks, you, you know Rob Banks. Uh, so I'm, he's oh, a South okay, Florida. No. He's a South Florida rapper, and he's also Shaggy's son. So you gotta check uh, him out. Rob, Rob, Rob Banks with a dollar sign as an as an S. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah. I'll oh, send I you see a few. Him. Yeah, 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 please, please, please. Yeah, yeah. And then my 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 last question for you is um. My last question for you is where is your favorite, um, you know, where, where's your favorite cultivator from? What, what state? I mean, you know. Or, or, or not a state, right? Well, what state or not a state? Is it well, okay. Before I answer, I'll say this. I recently went to my first dispensary in Jamaica. Uh, my family's Jamaican. And, right. you know, Jamaica has a long history with cannabis as part of the culture with Rastafarianism. Uh, but they re they passed the laws. It's legit now. Uh, it's legal. You can go to dispensaries. And I was very pleasantly surprised by the quality of flour that you can get there. It rivals some of the stuff that we can get in the States. And for the longest, I had a tough time finding high end flour in Jamaica when I would visit. But now you can go to a shop. Uh, and what's so great is like right out. Right, medical or recreational? Uh, it's recreational um because okay 
it actually is medical now that I remember because they make you fill out this form and you you basically you self certify. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, and but you know they have lounges where you could sit and you're like overlooking the beach and you can what? partake. Right. And I did that. I did that with my nephews uh, in June of last year. Uh, so shout out to Jamaica. But in response to your question, my area for the best cultivation has got to be California. That's the OGs. Okay. Um, you know, I've been to Humboldt. I've been in the mountains. Okay. I've seen some amazing things. Um, California still has the best flower in the world. Period. That's fair. That's fair. And 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 I have to take my trip. I mean, I went to California when I was young, so I wasn't, you know, uh, you know, a consumer. But I definitely got to go back and check out, you know, Northern California, especially. Um, yeah. But listen. Don't go by yourself. Like, I'll tell you one thing about the hill. They call it the hill, right? Uh, if you're there by yourself, everyone looks at you like you're crazy. Um, and some people would say to me, oh, it's because you're black. It's because you're black. It's not even a racist thing. Anyone who goes there that's not, like, accompanied by a known person, they're assuming you're there to poach and to look for grows to rob. And I'll never forget this. So I want, I was at this grow uh visiting these friends of mine and I wanted to jog because it's very beautiful uh, in Northern California. You know, you're in the forest, there's mountains, there's streams, it's gorgeous. So I wanted to go for a run outside. And the guy, I said to my friend, yeah, I'm gonna go for a run. He's like, no, he goes, no, you're not. I said, why not? I'm gonna run in the, I'm gonna run in, you know, in the backwoods. I'm gonna get a good sweat. He's like, listen, if you, if you go by yourself, you're not coming back. And he actually ha asked his wife, who's a runner as well, to come with me. Um, and as we're running, you know, she's waving to people who have like secret farms, like in the cut. Like I would have never have seen them, you know, what? and she's waving to people That's and saying, cool. hey, hey, yeah. And then the next day I was allowed to go by myself because I had seen people and I, and I, and then I would wave um, because they knew I was associated with uh, someone who's part of their community. But yeah, if you're going to go to Humboldt, definitely. I've heard, it, I've heard about the, the Humboldt and the Triangle. I've heard, you know. Yeah, yeah, I've heard about it, that. They call it Murder Mountain. Yes, Murder Mountain. But I will say, you know, just just there's two things. One, the best soil that I've had to date, whether it be Colorado, whether it be Maine, was soil that was cured correctly, number one. And number two, uh, it was grown in living soil, regenerative living soil, right? Like th those plants were so clean, so organic, so nutrient rich. Um, and you know, that, that's why I stand by, that's why I stand by that main flower. Cause I, you know, I was actually able to check out, uh, a living soil grow, uh, when I went, uh, to, to Maine. And so like, I intimately asked a bunch of questions, man, they are running this grow. And I think the water bill, um, is $74 a month. Like, so it's not only, yes. Yeah. How do they do that? It, for for one, it's just the the practices they're using as far as like catching the the humidity, they catching catch the water, rainwater, humidity. and all that stuff. Yeah, I I believe they're using some some degree of rainwater. I think that they're they're also catching the humidity um in the room uh and then reintegrating it back into the plants. Um and so they're they're doing a lot of great practices. Um and one of the things that I can really say is like you really you really realize the the cleanness, right? Mm -hmm. When you, when your weed has no P, uh, I think it's PBR or PGR, right? It has no PGR on it, or it doesn't have any of those other spray-ons or additives. Like it's just it's just a very clean smoke. Um, yeah. you so know, you so would say you like Maine over Massachusetts as far as as far as purity and oh, cleanliness. Oh, without a doubt, without without a doubt, it's and even the people in Massachusetts, with a lot of them will tell you that. But there, there's a good amount of Maine farmers that came from you know Massachusetts. Uh, so, uh, but, 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 but yeah, to, to be fair, you know, a lot of Massachusetts people will tell you that they put a lot of care in their cannabis in Oregon. One of the things that I will say that I saw in Massachusetts, I went to the only social uh, consumption lounge. So we need to have that conversation around social consumption lounges in, in Maryland, uh, because the thought is, is like, it was a beautiful place. It's been open five years. Um, most of the people or not most people, everyone is membership. Right. And, and, um, you know, the thought is it's a community. It's a community vibe. Everyone felt like safe and it was a safe space for consumption. 
Awesome. And so, like, you know, social consumption and, and living soil, those are two things, I, you know, I'm going to promote. You took from that trip? Yeah. Uh, yeah. D.C. and the, the new law actually allows for lounges as well. It's a pretty comprehensive law. So uh, that will be on deck. And I did want to say that a lot of people I, I know that a lot of the gift shops are worried because when Maryland, when you guys uh, have your system in place, that's going to take you know, probably 35, 40 percent, maybe more of our customer base, because a lot of people are coming in from Maryland. To, to go to gift shops. Um, so it's going to be very interesting to see which shops actually survive because, you know, sure. there, I, there are a ton of shops now, a lot sure. of great businesses, but a lot of them are just, you know, people who found a space and are able to trap, you know, let's, let's call it what <laughs> it is. Like, able to trap. And now, I, I, I agree with you and I understand where you're coming from because um, one of the things that I was going to ask was um, in this, new market we have can i as a maryland patient self-certify in dc or or no um i don't know i i'm i don't know but i would bet that you'd have to be a dc resident to self-certify yeah that that's that's what i would for, for, for a dc medical dispensary i would i would bet that no that that that, that, that that's what i would think um yeah. to some degree and, and so you know no what we're gonna say uh, I just have an interesting Massachusetts related story, if you have a moment. Uh, yeah, in yeah. So I had a oh, friend, awesome. I had a friend from California who was doing a lot of black market business towards the East Coast and working with someone in Massachusetts. And this guy in Massachusetts, in addition to doing his black market work, also opened uh, a dispensary, uh, okay. a medical dispensary. And uh, he was doing very well. Um, and this was, I'd have to say around 2015, 2014, 2015. Um, so the guy, my friend got arrested because the guy in Massachusetts, he got caught with a, a trailer of cannabis, maybe 1300 pounds or something that was being driven from California to Massachusetts. And it got caught in Massachusetts, but the Massachusetts DA did not want to take the case because A, okay. because of who it was, he had connections to the government, B, because of the laws being changed and they just had pledged not to take new cannabis cases. So what they did was they called a bunch of jurisdictions that were in the path of this RV and, you know, Illinois is like, oh, we're, we don't want to take it. And then another place, oh, we don't want to take it. And because they would have to find evidence, right, that this RV passed through there. So what they did was they found a receipt for gas in the RV from a state, I believe it was either Utah or Montana, some state, you know, out in the prairie area. Yeah. And they called that DA and they're like, yeah, yeah, we'll take the case. And, uh, you know, they they locked the guy up off the receipt. Now they never caught him with the cannabis. Like he was never actually with the cannabis, but the receipt is what caught, put him uh, into a case. And then he cooperated and told on my friend who ended up doing jail time because they had, they had worked together uh, for the past like three or four years. So enterprise. That's what it enterprise. Like. Exactly. Exactly. So, you know, and, and he went to jail. Let's see. It had to be 2014. He went to jail 2014. So he gets out in like 2018 and everything is legal. 2018, 2019. He had to do real time. And this is a white dude. Yeah. You, I you mean, didn't it, think it, that. It, it, it does happen. It does happen to everybody. I will say that if you've seen my show, Jonathan Wall, you know, yes, he's doing yes, we talked about years. It. I remember. I and, remember. Then, and then now, now, um, um, Mr. Uh, Junior Morris Jr. Um, I don't know that. Basically, name. basically, he got charged with kingpin status just solely for cannabis. I think back in like 2018, and um, th this year Tuesday is actually going to be the first time we hear it. There's going to be a bill to decrease that mandatory minimum because his son, I think, was um, given 20 um, 20 years due to mandatory minimum, um, and and basically given that kingpin statute. So they're reducing it to 10 years 
or that's what the bill hopes to do. Um, you know, mandatory minimums are terrible in its own self, but it, yeah. but like if we can rid away with them, sure. But at least we can decrease it and you know bring bring people like him home or at least earlier, way earlier because of decreased time and per- parole. So definitely keep you yeah. up to date on that. Yeah, please, please do, man. Uh, I I really do appreciate you having me on here. Uh, and and I want to apologize to both you and Gabriel because. You know, we did do a conversation at the Black Cannabis Week, and I had some technical difficulties. And it's funny because during the the uh, talk that we had, you know, that little mic I had, it was blinking, and I saw you notice it. Do you remember that? I think, yeah, I think you were like, yeah, it's good, it's good. It's some, yeah, yeah, it was not good. It was not good. So, uh, and I just want to apologize because I know Gabriel's gonna gonna let me have it when I see him next time. Uh, but officially, I want you. Gabriel, the entire world to know that I am sincerely sorry for uh, not properly recording that conversation because it was a good one. And, and you know, I'd love to come back to Capsule Dam and then your own space when you have it. And then yeah. also I'll, I'll have a, a podcast space uh, in Laurel and Columbia. So we'll definitely oh, be doing awesome. some more. Yeah, we'll do, we're doing some more in-persons for sure. Sounds great, we brother. Go to dispensary. If you want to go to dispensary next time, we can go to Remedy. You know, like uh-huh. we were supposed to we're supposed to drop um, drop the recording that I did uh, from Remedy, but just like you said, it was some technical difficulties. But you know, we definitely want to do more interviews there. It was a great, great uh, setting. So Re- Remedy is the space that uh, Gabriel had his event at, right? Is that is that the same space? Where did Gabe? No, that's that's um in Capital. That was a dispensary. That's in Capital. High. That's Marion, Maine. Okay. So Remedy, okay. Remedy right. is the one that's in Columbia. They got like two in Columbia now, and then they got one in like Baltimore County, like Woodlawn area. Okay. And so um, you you probably remember because it's one of the biggest ones, and you know they're very good with marketing. I say like it, it almost looks like MTV. They're like the MTV of the cannabis. Uh, oh, that's dope. You know, cannabis, yeah. Yeah, I'd love to check it out. Keep me keep me posted, bro. Yeah, I think Pusha T has some ownership into the company, and so that's why. They got this this crazy wreck feel, I think, but uh, I, I, they're, they're a good company. I, you know, I like them. Um, but the last thing I wanted to say was tell people how they can stay connected with you, you know, how they can get in touch with you. Um, oh, you know. yeah, for sure. Uh, social media, uh, Kevin Lance Murray on all social media except Twitter. Twitter, I'm uh, at K underscore L underscore M. But yeah, at Kevin Lance Murray on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. Uh, you can check me out there. For sure. Well, well, thank you so much, uh, Kev. You know, I appreciate you. You know, and I thank look forward for to seeing me. you. Yes, yes. All right. Bye, everyone. Take care. Talk to you soon. That was uh, Mr. K L M himself. Of course, you guys stay well. You know, make sure you drink your water and mind your business. See you next time.